Our next storyteller is Day Rose. Day has been a teacher of kids in Los Angeles and Italy and Palo Alto. She's part of the uh, graduate program at Stanford teaching. And for me personally, she's family. Um, but not just family, she's someone that creates family. And so it's so appropriate that she talks about her grandmother here. I've shared uh, many a meal at her table. I'm in love with both her kids, her wife, the doctor, and uh, just everything she brings to that table. Uh, I'm so glad she's going to bring some of it here today. So come on up. Thanks, Elliot. Is this on? OK. So this is a story that I wrote about my grandma, Ida. Here is what I know. She came to the United States from Russia around 1908, when she was 13 or 14 years old. She traveled all alone on a ship to meet her sister, who had come before her and had already found a husband. She left her parents, her home, her friends, her school, her life, everything she knew. Before she left, it was a very dangerous time to be a Jew in her village. There were a lot of pogroms, violent, destructive, and dangerous for all the Jews. And even though she was just a young girl, she and her friends weren't allowed to ever stand or walk together in a group, or the Cossack soldiers would rough them up to separate them. A group was more than two. And sometimes even two 13-year-old girls standing together were considered dangerous by the elite soldiers of the Russian Tsar and were told to separate and move along. My grandma Ida told me these things while she knitted clackety-clack, an Afghan for me or for my sisters. She was always knitting something. She made other sounds, too, while she knitted. Her breath came in a bit of a wheeze because she only had one lung, and her false teeth did a little clackety-clack a bit like her knitting needles. I think they didn't fit quite right. She would chomp them a little bit to keep them in place. I found out about her only having one lung when I was 15. My mother was 55, and my grandma was 74. And we all smoked cigarettes. My mother smoked pretty much incessantly then, two packs a day. My grandma was not allowed to smoke, doctor's orders, and my mom had bought her these plastic cigarettes to help her with her quitting. They were nothing like the fancy cigarettes of today. They were just a little bit of plastic that looked like a cigarette. My grandma would hold the plastic cigarette between her fingers, and sometimes she'd take it up to her lips. And as for me, I stole a few real cigarettes from my mom, and I would sneak outside to smoke them a few times a day. One day, I came home from school early, and there was my grandma sitting at the breakfast counter, watching the miniature TV that was in the corner, and she was smoking a little butt of a cigarette. I said, Grandma, with true surprise and real outrage. My grandma didn't turn. She didn't do anything. She s sat there. She took the butt of the cigarette down, put it out with her thumb, put it into her apron pocket, <laughs> found the plastic cigarette, put it back up, <laughs> put it to her lips. And then she said, darling, you're home early. What is the deal with grandma smoking, I asked my mom later. She's not supposed to smoke. She only has one lung, my mom told me. But she sneaks a smoke sometimes, I said, worried. I caught her. I know, but as long as she's only sneaking, she's not doing it very much, so I don't say anything. <laughs> and after that, I started to notice that the bathroom was sometimes smoky when she left it, and pretty soon, I would smoke in the bathroom, too, and just figure my mom would think it was her. 
The knitting was supposed to help keep her hands busy so that she wouldn't think about smoking. So she knit and watched television a lot. The one sort of program that she could never watch were war movies. They upset her no matter which war they depicted. So I dutifully got up to switch the channel whenever one came on. On the other hand, she loved to watch westerns, especially John Wayne. I guess that it's because the Duke didn't remind her of anyone at all. Her absolutely favorite thing to watch were old Shirley Temple movies, any of them. While she loved her granddaughters and while her own daughter could do no wrong, there was nobody like baby Shirley with her curls and her dimples. She's so talented, my grandma gushed. I would watch The Little Colonel, Bright Eyes, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, Curly Top with her over and over, black and white and grainy, punctuated by ads that my grandma sometimes talked back to. NBC wishes everyone a very happy holiday, the TV would say. Thank you very much, my grandma would answer. <laughs> when Grandma Ida left Russia, she came through Ellis Island and lived with her older sister Edith and Edith's husband in New Jersey. She worked in a button factory and earned maybe 10 cents a day. Three of those cents bought her lunch, a small fish called a kipper and a roll of bread. When she was 16, she married Edith's husband's brother, my grandpa Izzy. When she was 17, she gave birth to a stillborn baby boy. When she was 19, she gave birth to my mother at home because she was afraid if she went to the hospital, the baby would die again. When my mother was born, everyone was so excited they forgot to write up a birth certificate for her, something no one realized until they tried to register her school years later. These things my grandma told me while she sipped a cup of hot tea with a sugar cube between her teeth. Sometimes she'd tell me about the silver samovar in her nice house in her village, which kept the tea hot all day. She told me very little about Russia because she always started to cry when she talked about her home and her mother. Somewhere there is a photograph of some stern-looking people posing, and I wonder if one of them is my great-grandmother. My mother would get upset at me for asking questions that made my grandma so sad, so I stopped asking. Izzy and Ida had a laundry, first in New Jersey and then later on in New York. My grandma would wash and iron other people's clothes every day, except Saturday. She'd put my mother in one of those rolling laundry baskets to play by herself while my grandma and grandpa worked long hours. This, she told me, while she ironed a shirt for me, teaching me how to smooth the cuffs and straighten the collar. She ironed with a damp cloth to make steam. Whenever I smell steam from a hot iron now, that is always my grandma to me. My grandpa died when he was 68, and after that my grandma would visit us, sometimes for a month or two at a time, to get away from the New York winters and not be alone. She would stay on the other bed in my room. My roommate, she called to me with a smile. I would do homework while she read, and I'd watch her toes twitch when I looked up from my books. When my grandma died, I was the same age she was when she became a mother. I was a kid, a wild college girl, and she had already lost the son and was raising a daughter. I worked at posh department stores during school breaks and argued with my mother about chores. She scrubbed and washed and ironed and cooked and cleaned every single day. I wish I had asked her so much more. I wish I could tell her story the way it deserves to be told. Thank you.